Uh, good afternoon or good evening, because I'm in Italy and I know uh, that in Georgia it's different time. Uh, I think it's half past five in Georgia, then maybe we can start our section. Um, I think so. I don't know if somebody else has to present. I'm at the chair of the track. I am Patricia Gazzola. Uh, I'm Italian and I'm in Italy at the moment. And uh, um, our section is about social science. A very interesting section. Uh, we have seven presentations, then also different field. I think that the connection between the different field uh, would be very interesting, but of course, I, we can resume at the end of our section. I hope that everybody uh, of the presenter uh, will be will be there, will be online, and I think uh, uh, that um, we we ca we can start if you have not a question or suggestion about the the section, and the first presenter. Uh, will be, or, you know, I, I read the first the title and then the name because I don't know if I make a mistake. And um, the first presentation will be about the constructed the performance landscape from the 16th to 19th century Indian Galamar paintings. And then Balaji Venkalachari and Shuruti Mutai Desai. But I think that you can say better than me your name and surname, and you can present yourself. You can share the screen, and you can start with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you have 15 minutes uh, for your yeah. presentation. OK, yeah. you are ready. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, perfect, perfect. We can see very well. OK. Uh, so let me set myself a stopwatch. Uh, and yeah, uh, my name is uh, Shruti Mutalik Desai. Uh, me, along with a dear friend and colleague of mine, Balaji Venkatachari, is going to be talking about reconstructing the performance landscapes from Ragmala paintings. Um, so the outline that we have followed for this presentation, basically, we'll be talking about introduction first. A brief discussion about the methodology that has been followed for this research. Uh, then we'll try to explain what Ragmala paintings are and what are the various elements and parts of a painting. Uh, then we will talk about how we have tried to connect it with the idea of a performance landscape and how we've been able to recognize elements which are recurring. And hence, we are from all of this, we are able to identify themes which these paintings follow. And uh, we will be concluding with certain conclusive remarks and what the scope of future study uh, for this research is. Uh, introduction, because this uh, painting tradition is a combination of several Indian traditions. Uh, first, uh, uh, the, it is an amalgamation of an Indian painting tradition and also Indian music tradition. So I'll give a brief introduction about both. Uh, Indian painting traditions is spread across the Indian subcontinent. Uh, there are a lot of regional types and variations available. In this slide, uh, the first painting is actually a Tanjavur painting, which is famous and mostly found in the state of Tamil Nadu in south of India. And uh, it is famous because it uses gold foil in its painting. Mm, the next one is called the Varli painting, which is again uh, mostly associated with central and, uh, you know, uh, with central India. Then we have Gond, which focuses a lot on representations of animals and landscapes and various plants and trees that are found within the Indian subcontinent. This is also associated with central India. And then the last image here is a Patachitra, which is actually a painting tradition from the state of Orissa uh, in India, which is more towards the eastern part, eastern central part of India. Uh, so like this, there are various painting traditions. And the painting tradition we are going to be concentrating on is the Ragmala paintings. Uh, and to understand a little bit about Ragmala paintings, we need to understand that it is the connection between, it is basically trying to talk about a particular Indian music tradition. Uh, now, Indian musical traditions can be uh, mostly classified, the classical types are two. One is the Carnatic music, the other is the Hindustani classical music. And as far as my understanding goes, the Ragmala paintings are associated with the Hindustani music tradition. 
and uh, these paintings almost all of these paintings that i have discussed till now have used uh, have been used as sources for various landscape studies and uh, which gives us an insight into the landscape the sort of vegetation etc that was there in the indian subcontinent at that period in time uh, so a, a quick discussion about the methodology our aim is very evident in our title uh, our main source for this entire exercise was the claus ebeling collection of ragmala paintings uh, which is found in the cornell university's digital library the digital library i have to tell you has 4000 plus paintings but there are only about 894 which have a locational attribute to them so basically we know which part of the indian subcontinent these paintings come from and our uh, set is that and our sampling uh, our sample size is derived from these 894 paintings uh, the sampling criteria was to use stratified sampling so that there is representation across all geographical areas uh, so location also played an important role ragas basically we tried to include paintings which are depictive of various ragas and uh, we also tried to keep in mind that it should be representative of the various landscapes that we wanted to discuss uh, the larger theoretical framework under which the study sits is that of the cultural geography and the concept that we are relying on is the concept of cultural landscapes because performance landscapes are a form of cultural landscape and that will be explained in detail by my colleague and um, uh, as evident the research is qualitative in nature and we have relied totally on content analysis of these paintings um so through this we know that there is a uh, uh, evident uh, this connection of performance landscapes in these things and we've been able to arrive at themes based on this study and finally we have tried to discuss what the findings and conclusions are of this entire research so this is a quick snippet of uh, how we did the sampling Uh, so we have the location what the total number of paintings are what is the sample percentage of these paintings that we've considered hence our sample size and the link to uh, you know all the paintings that were there and we've also mentioned the raga or the category of music under which uh, each of these paintings fall uh, so uh, to talk about ragmala paintings uh, ragmala is a painting tradition from the 16th to 19th century india belonging to various regional courts so there is representation from rajasthan deccan northern hill regions and central india uh, ragmala literally means a garland of ragas so ragas are basically melodic frameworks um uh, as in the western uh, equivalent of that and these paintings represent uh, melodic modes in classical music tradition these are miniature paintings so essentially what is seen pretty large here on the screen are actually really small in reality um and uh, i think uh, my colleague will take it forward from here balaji yeah so uh, that we are going to talk about the period location subjects and materials of ragmala paintings before we get into the um, get into looking into the landscape themes on these paintings so uh, ragmala paintings uh, uh, come from 16th to 19th century india Rep uh, next slide please shruti so if you look at the map of india over the uh, over various uh, chronological time period they have come from uttar pradesh rajasthan gujarat and deccan which is south of india almost close to south of india we don't have evidence from deep south india apart from that i think largely it's representative of these regions largely we see ragmala paintings coming from the mughal uh, period historic time period that is where the ragmala paintings come from perhaps uh, the purpose of these paintings were um, twofold i mean one is to uh, understand understand the raga melodic modes using the visual medium you know perhaps it might have been used to train people to understand the uh, visual effect and then to sing the music with that kind of a, to create the moods you know that was one usage the other thing uh, was uh, that these paintings collect consists of a portfolio belonging to single raga category which has parent raga and the uh, uh, and the offspring ragas which uh, forms around 36 to 42 paintings in the portfolio these were used for uh, pleasurable viewing in the zanenas and or the female quarters in the royal palaces that was one of the purposes of ragmala paintings next slide so this uh, if you take up one ragmala painting this is how it looks like these are the parts of ragmala painting you know uh, almost all ragmala painting 
Sanskrit has got a verse or a couplet, which is here. You what you can see is in Sanskrit. They come from uh, roughly somewhere around fifth century uh, A.D.s. Uh, Naradiya Shiksha, which is the traditional treatise which records documents the uh, musical modes and musical methods and how to uh, follow it and all that. These verses, uh, couplets, you know, small verses are used to explain that. And what is found in the verses are explain are uh, visually illustrated on the Ragmala painting. So there is a central deity for each of these paintings you can see one of the central deity which is you know people deity and a type where you can see one say, seated there and then you can find varying types of architectural representations that bring forth to the mood and represent seasons and colors etc and you find varying uh, fauna and flora depending on the mood and setting of the ragas each ragas are strictly associated with certain seasons and uh, certain um, uh, certain moods so each raga or the melodic mode has to evoke such uh, feelings so the painting tries to visually illustrate that and musical instrument are also uh, varied according to the regional representations you find different musical instruments in deccani ragamala paintings compared to the rajasthani ragamala paintings so uh, this is what basically it looks like there is usually you find the border also to ragamala paintings this one does not have but most of the ragamala paintings have a unique border from which you can identify this next to the so when we come to colors of ragmala paintings they are um, all from natural elements either uh, minerals or animal or plant products so uh, we also have a story for yellow color there is a big ball of yellow uh, material used which is called indian yellow which uh, there is a theory that it comes from a cow's urine which is fed of a certain kind of uh, food so it produces a yellow pigment which you cannot obtain from other sources so that is used uh, in these paintings next so we are going to look at the ragamala paintings we have decided to look at it from the cultural landscape perspective cultural uh, landscape is a phenomena where we look at the uh, landscape ideas of people which is represented into various cultures cultural geography is the methodology used to study cultural landscape according to this uh, theory we have three types of landscapes design landscape organically evolved landscape which can be continuing from the past or relic which has uh, lost its use over the years the third category is associative cultural landscape which can be associated the landscape could be associated with cultural or artistic or religious uh, values so uh, ragamala paintings belong to associative cultural landscape where the landscape elements are used to depict the cultural tradition musical cultural uh, traditions from india uh performance landscapes are cultural landscapes so we are looking at it from this perspective I, um through looking through the lens of this theory we have categorized the themes from observed from the uh, paintings which evoke the performance landscape from these paintings season ambiance time of the day story gender and social structure architecture color and geometry they come together to evoke the moods of the raga or the melodic moods next slide uh yeah so when we talk about uh, season uh, we have taken these two paintings where this is of um, rag meg which essentially represents the rainy season and then you have rag vasant which represents uh, the season of spring so there is a very clear difference here we can see the darker heavier clouds uh, darker tones are used contrast clothing to make the darker clouds more evident whereas on this side we see that everything is in full bloom it is abundant we see lighter sky and even mood of the painting is that of celebratory you know it's it's rather celebratory bala next yeah so next theme is ambiance ambiance was very important uh, for creating because each raga when we are also taught the melodic modes to sing we are always insisted that while singing we have to try and attempt to create the ambiance meant for the melodic mode so here you can see two examples one from rag bhairavi from uttar pradesh 1600s and the other one rag asavari from uh, 17th century uttar pradesh so in rag bhairavi you can see it's a it creates a devotional ambiance the what is the lady doing in the center uh, central figure is she is uh, performing um, a ritual and she is ma making an offer to a deity uh, called shiva in india which is represented in the form of shiva linga on the right hand side you can see a more uh, fiercey landscape with all snakes surrounding and there is krishna one of the indian deities walking through this landscape fiercey landscape uh, fearlessly you know this is the kind of uh, mood the raga also tries to evoke Yes. Uh, then the next theme we identified was time of the day. So we have taken rag Gauri and rag Lalit. Now these ragas are also associated and 
usually used to evoke feeling of a particular time of the day so here we see that rag gori is a morning raga is a daytime raga hence the representation of the sky is again something that gives us the idea of a daytime uh, brighter colors are used the landscape representation is also like that whereas rag lalit is a late night raga and um, we see that uh, we see that the people are mostly represented indoors we see stars in the sky we see you know a crescent moon which is all representative of the fact that it is night time so um, story is an important element of ragmala paintings because um, uh, many many episodes are captured for example a war scene as commonly seen in ragnat you know one important thing to notice here is almost all ragmala paintings that represent ragnat from varying regions across the time period they show a war scene and then ragas uh, raga hindol you know irrespective of uh, various regions and across the time period show a swing you know where you can see uh, see the deity uh, with the spot sitting and uh, enjoying the swing uh, festival yes sir okay. uh, then we can also see representations of gender and social structure what we found was uh, there was a good representation across uh, of genders and these were not just non binary we found uh, you know representations of beyond the two normally accepted or seen sexes as well then even in terms of a uh, social structure we can see that they have used different colors to represent males and females different colors to represent different people belonging to different parts uh, or different social strata and we also see depictions where two females are shown independently a male and a female is shown uh, you know uh, in a rather close position so we feel that it is representative of a rather liberal social structure that existed during that time period next yeah so architecture also forms a major part of the uh, representations of the raga you can see varied representations in varied perspectives for example you could see on the right hand side rag bhairava from uttar pradesh where you can see a sort of perspective which is not similar to the right hand side painting and the royal uh, palace the ambiance which is created using the architectural elements of domes and arches and courtyards in and one raga in compared to another uh, so for example bungalow shows a very vernacular local mud structure next to the Uh, then we have color and geometry we see that they use various washes strokes uh, we see use of dull colors bright pigments flat tones intricate techniques etc uh, and in terms of geometry we see that they have tried to represent various garden layouts what we can see here is charbag which is essentially a mughal garden which relies heavily on geometry they we see use of various patterns we see arches roofs etc and even the kind of views that are there so we have perspective views orthographic projections plan views etc to balaji in in conclusion we would like to make some quick points in conclude our presentation um so uh, we see how landscape and architectural elements have been used to visually convey an abstract art form like music it almost forms a vocabulary in these paintings when you look at the painting you immediately know which raga and its effect it is trying to convey the elements seem to be picked up from a palette of accepted vocabulary and remain consistent throughout all regions and time period themes convey the diversity and regional variations a cursive study suggests the setting to be largely aristocratic while representation of people is more inclusive so this these paintings capture the spirit of music into landscape forms yes sir and uh, for future study we wish to because this was just an initial study we wish to take it forward and perhaps do a larger research on this where we intend to do cross reading of these paintings with various ragas verses and couplets to see if the painting exactly depicts what the raga is trying to say a classification of various elements and their interrelationship we have been only looking at certain elements so we want to see if there are more and what is the interrelationship between these and how they are interconnected with the raga and uh, the research uh, currently only relies uh, on the claus ebling collection from uh, cornell university so we intend to look at other sources which also uh, have a collection of the ragmala paintings um uh, thank you and uh, i'm sorry i think we exceeded the time limit by about a minute and a half Uh, but not not so much, not so much. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Very interesting. I know that the discussion will be only at the end of the whole section. Then uh, we wait uh, uh, the end for a question or, or your your very interesting, interesting presentation and research. Thank you very much. Thank Then you. I'll I stop presenting now. Yeah.
thank, yeah, thank you for this opportunity we would like to thank the team uh, for giving us this opportunity to present it yeah. but thank the subject you. i think is very interesting the connection but of course i leave the time uh, for the discussion at the end okay thank uh, now I leave the floor to the next presenter from Ukraine. Uh, it's the time of uh, Miamlina Antonina. And the subject is the title is Advertisement of the Book, The Pandemic Case. Are you there? Uh, maybe no. Maybe no. Uh, Miamlina Antonina maybe is not there. I hope that, that she will join us. She will be able to join us. Okay, if she's not there, maybe I can make my presentation because I'm the next presenter and I will uh, now introduce again myself and my, uh, and my paper. Uh, the paper is also connected to the to the land, the landscape, but in different way. I try to share the screen also. And one moment, please. Then can you see my screen or not yet? Not uh, yet. Not, I yet. Think it's not yet, yeah. not yet. We, we can see it now. Yeah. Maybe we yes. can see it. Now? Yeah. now yes. Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay, thank you. And um, I will start with the title. Uh, my subject is about the circular economy for sustainable fashion, from food to fashion. Um, the paper is written by me, Patrizia Gazzola, and my colleague Roberta Pezzetti and Cecilia Severi. I come from Italy, you already know, and the university is the University of Insubria that is located in the northern part of Italy, near the mountain, and um, the other presenter also. And the third presenter is another university that is based in uh, another region, Pindemont region. Then uh, my paper is about the connection in a sustainable way uh, between uh, fashion and food. Because one of uh, the, the problem of our uh, period, of our generation, is f uh, waste. And waste, uh, especially waste created uh, from the food industry. And uh, we uh, make this research uh, to transform uh, the waste in an opportunity. And I made uh, several research about uh, uh, fashion. Then uh, I try to put together fashion with the food. Then uh, to reuse uh, uh, the waste uh, is, uh, the, and uh, to produce something very useful uh, and uh, to give a new life to the waste, uh, I think is a very good solution to not to, to solve the problem, but to try to reduce the problem. And uh, we develop the principle of a circular economy that is very, I think, uh, very, very famous, especially uh, nowadays. And uh, I start with the linear economy that was the economy of uh, some years ago, and maybe is also used. Linear economy is to develop uh, all the production process to the beginning to the end. But of course, um, we start with to use the resources, with the production, with the distribution, with the consumption, and then we have something that go to the waste. But linear economy is not uh, sustainable now. Uh, we have to go to the circular economy. Why? Uh, uh, if we just produce and we create waste, produce and create waste, uh, of course, we don't know what to do with the waste. And we have uh, so many waste. Italy has this problem, but also, you know, uh, Europe has this problem, but also India has this problem, China has the same problem. We don't know what to do. Now we try to uh, separate uh, uh, the waste, but it's not, not enough. You know, we have to reuse the waste. Then the idea that we already know is go from the linear economy to the circular economy. But of course, we have to push in some way and we have to help uh, the development of this circular economy. Then we have to uh, manage the transition. 
from the uh, model of uh, um, linear economy to the circular economy. Then the linear economy go only in one way. You know, we produce uh, and we have waste. Circular economy, of course, is circular. We have to produce, we have to use uh, resources. We produce, uh, we use the production, and then we have to come back. We have to put again the waste into the circle. Then we have to transform the waste into a raw material, into resources again. Then if we can use, reuse, recycle, we can uh, use the waste that we don't know how to put, or we don't know how to use, or we don't know where to, to put that kind of waste. Then uh, we have a two research question. Then the first research question, and um, if we want to reuse uh, that kind of waste, can we use food waste for fashion industry? And in this way, we can reduce the impact of the pollution and then the second research question is connected to this uh, sustainable development goal. You know that uh, we have some important goal uh, and uh, for 2030 we want uh, to reach that goal. And then uh, the second research question is connected with uh, the uh, way to reach uh, the sustainable development goal. And, uh, if a company uh, that are in fashion uh, industry, uh, thanks to circular economy, can reach also sustainable development goal. Then we analyze uh, um, the fashion industry because uh, also fashion industry is very famous uh, uh, for polluting because they use uh, water, but not only they use a lot of water, they use a lot, lot of energy, but also because uh, now we are in time of fast, fast fashion. Then the fast fashion, uh, is that uh, every uh, maybe two weeks uh, they change everything. Then uh, they push uh, people to buy, buy and buy. Then uh, it's not enough to buy one pair of shoes, but uh, we have 10, 20, 30 pair of shoes. That is not very necessary. <laughs> then I, um, we started from the waste problem and uh, here you can see the pyramid always problem, then it's not a problem only of food, but a problem of food, of fashion, and so on. And the pyramid waste start from the disposal that we have to, uh, to use in some way, and go to uh, the recycle and go to the reuse. But of course, the best solution is to prevent then we have to reduce as much as possible something that has to become a disposal. Because if we have disposal, we need to uh, manage the disposal. And then uh, if we compare with some years ago, the problem is become uh, bigger and bigger. Because um, if we analyze the overshoot day, is the day which community consume all the resources produced by the planet through the year. And when they start to calculate this day, the first time was in 1971, the day, the overshoot day was 21 of December. And in 2021 was 29 of July. That is approximately and the middle of the year. And 2020 was 22 August, but uh, for due to uh, the, uh, the COVID-19 pan the pandemic. Then the situation in uh, only 50 years uh, is becoming more and more problematic. Then um, you can see here the wedding cake. And uh, to analyze the problem of food waste, uh, that is the base of our research, uh, and to reach the 17 um, goal of uh, sustainable development goal. 
that are um, very connected also with food, but not only. Then they are um, some very famous, the, uh, so the Sustainable Development Goal. Some are connected with economy, some are connected with the society, and some are connected with the environment, with the, the sphere. But uh, our research is connected with the five best practices, then five companies that are in fashion industry, but they use waste of food to uh, develop their project uh, of raw material that they use for uh, dresses for fashion. And the first is orange fiber. Uh, some of the companies are based in Italy, some are based somewhere else. Orange fiber use orange peel that nobody used. And uh, for example, in Italy, they started in Sicily, south of Italy, where they are full of orange. And they use orange peel to make very uh, nice uh, raw material for dresses. And Due di Latte is also an Italian company. And they uh, started to uh, produce uh, um, raw material uh, by milk that was uh, overdue. And there was a woman that has some overdue milk in the fridge. And she said, what I, can I do? I don't want to throw away. And they started to make a research about to use uh, overdue milk to produce uh, raw material. It's very nice raw material, similar to silk. And other company uh, is uh, also interesting, Pinatex. Pinatex is not Italian. Uh, they use pineapple, pineapple uh, leaves, uh, and they use pineapple leaves uh, to produce, uh, uh, again, raw, um, raw material for glasses. Escafe use uh, um, recycled uh, coffee, and uh, they uh, try to apply to use circular economy, starting from some waste to, uh, to make something new, and also very fashion, because now, also people are very interesting to uh, find uh, some um, new kind of uh, you know, fashion connected also with the environment. They don't want to make a pollution. And here you can see a table where I compare, but of course and nothing else, and then I, I skip to the conclusion because also I have 15 minutes. Uh, then um, I compare the uh, five companies, you know, and they use uh, different kind of uh, waste from food. Orange fiber, I told to you, orange. Due di latte milk. Uh, Vegea use uh, some grapes and Pinatex pineapple, and Escafé use coffee. And they uh, have also import important, uh, or they produce directly the raw material, or uh, they transform a part of raw material, or another company consume the raw material. And then uh, the, where they are based, you know, the first three companies are based in Italy, uh, the first is Sicily because they are full of orange. Uh, the second, Due di Latte, is based in Milan. And the other is based uh, in uh, Rovereto, also in Italy. The other two, one is uh, based where the pineapple are there, then the Philippines and Spain. And the other is based, uh, uh, Escafé is based in Taiwan. Then uh, some information also about the process that they use uh, uh, to, for the production and also uh, information about uh, how, they, uh, how they use the raw material they transform. Then orange fiber, only fashion. Uh, due di latte, uh, not only fashion, but also for some uh, pa inside the part of automotive. Uh, Vegea also fashion, furniture, again, automotive. Pinatex, again, fashion, furniture, packaging, and automotive. And Escafé, only fashion. And also I analyzed in the website of the uh, companies, also the SDG that are, they are following 
thanks to the use of uh, um, to recycle and to use the raw material, the, the waste of food, and also uh, the circular economy, what SDG they are they are following. Then here you can see just my my table. And I skip to the conclusion, of course, because my, my time is finished, but at the end we can discuss together. And what can I say then? Uh, new ideas uh, bring uh, um, a new way to uh, make uh, business also. Then is an opportunity, especially in the future, more and more. Try to check what kind of uh, um, waste there are and try to find a solution to use the waste in different way. For example, for fashion, because uh, if you use for fashion, you can uh, um, create also value because you know, for fashion, you can have good price uh, and you can, uh, um, uh, you can uh, uh, pay also for your research uh, that you made uh, before. Then uh, uh, normally waste are something very bad, but now they could be also an opportunity to make something new. And also some very important brand, uh, very famous fashion brand Italian that are using the raw material or orange fiber and so on. Then thank you for your attention. But of course, at the end, if you have a question, you can, you can ask. Okay, thank you again. I uh, don't know if um, if the colleague from Ukraine uh, is here or not. Maybe I go to the next presenter and if she will come with us, maybe I, um, I will ask again. Okay, now is the time of the next presenter. I read the first, the, the title, the transmission of the art of war in the English speaking culture. And uh, the presenter is a Liu Kuiken. Uh, I don't know exactly, but please say you, Hong Kong Metropolitan University. Uh, thank you, I leave the floor to you and please uh, make your presentation. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, my name is you can just call me Dolly. Yes, <laughs> Liu Chen. Yes, yes. 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 Um, and uh, let me try because I haven't tried this website before. Please, um, you can try, and we probably. can see if uh, if uh, we can see or not. Uh, you you know how to to share. You can see a, a rectangle. You know uh, at the the top and the bottom. You can see the microphone, the camera. Uh, something more, a hand, and then there is a square with the arrow. You have to push yes, to the I'm square with the arrow. Yes, I'm trying to use this. Can you see the square with the arrow? Uh, near the three I points. Guess, I okay. guess you can see it now. It is, yeah, it's perfect. Good. Yeah, yes. we can see your presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, my, my, my presentation is the transmission of the art of war in the English speaking culture. And um, first of all, I would like to talk about, introduce the, the art of war. It's, a, it's an ancient treatise in ancient China. It is very, uh, very famous. Um, it was written it, in the late spring uh, uh, and autumn period. And uh, normally it was attributed uh, to the ancient Chinese military strategist Sun Zi. Uh, and it is composed of 13 chapters. Each chapter is devoted to a set of different skills related to war and how it applies to military strategy tactics. And for almost 1,500 years, it was the lead text in an anthology that was formalized as the seven military classics by Emperor Shenzong of Song in in 1080 
and the out of war remains the most influential strategy text in the East Asian warfare and has influenced both Eastern and Western military thinking, business tactics, legal strategy, lifestyles, and beyond. And I would like to tackle the, 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 my, my theme from these two points. Uh, the first one is the publishing phenomenon of Sun Zi related works in English. Uh, the art of war was widely translated and adapted into different languages. Translation alone, more than 14 languages, including Japanese, Korean, French, Russian, German, Spanish, and English, were published. Yang reported that by 2006, at least 28 English translations were published, in excluding the reprinted ones. The writer, uh, that is me, uh, I have found at least 24 ver versions that are selling in Amazon.com by September 2020. These translations aim at different purposes catering for a wide range of audience. There are versions that are translated specially for the purpose of sinological study, like the ones by Giles and Ames. Uh, some others, which put more emphasis on transmitting the military essence in the art of war, employed a way more familiar to English-speaking audiences to render Sun Tzu's words. For example, Griffith version is the most famous of the type. Many add study guides and commentaries to make the text more reader-friendly, while at the same time still prefer, pre preserve the rich Chinese culture in the translations. For instance, the version rendered by John Minford. There are also translators who combine the art of war which other, uh, with other Chinese ancient classes into one book and introduce them to the readers as a whole set of ancient Chinese military wisdom. Last but not least, probably out of the purpose of attracting young people, some added comic illustrations on the basis of translation so that readers can enjoy easy reading, but also know more about Chinese culture. Overall speaking, the translation phenomenon of the art of war is complex, involving different text types and emphasis. Apart from tr translation, the publication phenomenon of the art of war's adaptations cannot be ignored. According to the data I collected from Amazon.com alone, um, over 160 related works were found, excluding the ones that only mentioned the art of war in certain chapters. It is reasonable to infer from this fact that there must be more adaptations published in the market. Among these adaptations, Nearly half of them adapted the art of war into business strategies. Others cover many different realms, uh, realms including interpersonal relationship, education, sports, personal development, gaming, politics, attorney, medical practices, security issues, application to a certain war, and etc. From this, we can see that typical adaptations of the art of war include contents from specific competition with set rules and clear goals. For instance, sports, game, and a specific war to abstract conflicts that may come in any forms. For instance, personal development, education, romance, Business is in the middle of this long continuum as it covers a wide range of activities that can be more concrete like the selling process or more abstract like managing the employees. 
And uh, next, I would like to talk about the popularity of applying the art of war to strategic thinking from two from two angles. The first one is scholarly discussions. Though the subject of adaptations can be specific or abstract, all of them share a theme that they are issues that require strategic planning and decision. And this, uh, to some extent, explains the popularity of Sun Tzu being chosen as the source of adaptation. Thomas Clary, who produced one of the frequently cited translations of The Art of War, highly regards Sun Tzu's thoughts as still perhaps the most pre prestigious and influential book of stra strategy in work today, and argues that it has been as eagerly studied in Asia by modern politicians and executives as it has been by military leaders and strategists for the last two millennia and the more. Chen supports Clary's argument in pointing out Chinese firms work on business strategies based on Chinese uh, Chinese philosophies, Sun Tzu being one of these much referred great thinking. In fact, the seminal work has not only influenced Asian thinking, but also attracted, if not yet deeply affected, scholars all around the world as well. Zhang suggests that China's economic boom since the 90s has attracted attention from Western business people, and thus the philosophies used when Chinese enterprises conduct their business. Researchers have conducted studies regarding how these philosophies, especially the art of war, relate to and influence the strategic thinking of business or even all shared human activities involving conflict and problem solving. Bom pr proposes six principles for healthcare professionals based on the art of war. Zhang investigated what role did Sun Tzu's thinking play on the relationship between the performance of Chinese international enterprises and the, institu and the institutional environment. Li not only points out Sun Tzu's modern and global implications for business, but also raises historical examples of applying Sun Tzu's idea to commerce, arguing that Sun Tzu's thinking has been applicable throughout history. However, apart from the enthusiasm on applying the art of war to strategic thinking, especially business strategies, there are also questions regarding to the uh, regarding the adaptability. Uh, adaptability of Sun Tzu's thought to some realms. Kalidastel criticizes people's misuse of the art of war in business field in that many are ignorant that when the scenario turns from war to business, the focus also changes from competitors to customers who make decisions. McCann questions the compatibility of war and business, alerting the problem of business ethics when blindly applying the art of war to all business scenarios. For him, war is a zero-sum game, but business can be a win-win, which is a decisive factor affecting decision making. In zero sum games, people would strive for their goal at any cost, and thus immoral tactics like deception or using espionage is acceptable ex acceptable under this under this ground of death and life, which may be constitute uh, which may constitute negative influence to modern business ethics. Nevertheless, even though there are scholars pointing out the incompatibility between war and business or other realms, having difference from the war does not render the art of war irrelevant to business 
and other strategic thinking. As Neil argues, we on we on the one hand should marvel at how much Sun Tzu has understood in forming strategic principles, while on the other, we should not forget all the advances human beings have achieved in the understanding of this topic since Sun Tzu and since Sun Tzu. And as a result, we must address the issue of how best to interpret and analyze his writings in the context of these advances, since it is in this way that we maximize the art of war's contemporary relevance. To quote McCain, McCain himself, like other preceding ancient wisdom, the art of war should be taken seriously, if not literally, which means that Appropriation is a must for a successful application of the art of war. And next, I would like to talk about Sun Tzu in the real market. Um, the attention on Sun Tzu is not confined to scholarly discussion. Actually, as early as 1987, the art of war has already appeared in popular culture when in the film Wall Street, Gore Getko, a corporate raider, was instructing his fresh recruit, Bud Fox, protagonist of HBO television drama series, the Sopanus, Tony Sopanus mentioned similar opinions as Gecko and these appearance in public attention, according to Cardinal, created the market for popular interpretations of the, uh, the art of war, particularly with reference to business strategy. Sun Tzu's popularity among public is no accident. By Ames, uh, both Ames, Clar Clary, uh, Ames, Clary, and Minford suggest the art of war has universal value. Ames comments the art of war as a philosophical test, text which provides a prototype for other types of human conflicts, while Clary remarks that the art of war is the first of all a great source for comprehending the fundamentals of conflict, uh, conflict and resolution. Minford notes that Sun Tzu used in a very intuitive and general way with the working of natural, human, and interpersonal dynamics. In this respect, it, ha it has great interest and value for all people and all ages. Neil's argument on strategic principles further explains why the art of war can arouse interest among people. Human existence involves three fundamental facts. Firstly, they independ interdependent. Firstly, their interdependent fate. Secondly, the common reality of conflict of goals. And finally, the occurrence of all kinds of wars as a consequence of conflict and goals. Uh, of, of, of the first two facts. Therefore, uh, the topic of strategic principle can always captive people and thus the art of war, the first written record of the attempt to understand strategy and conflict in a coherent and general way, as Neil puts it, has a good reason to be of great interest. Moreover, when comparing the game theory, Neil notes that Sun Tzu not only puts forward general principles, but also demonstrates the art of rendering logical and abstract reasoning practical, uh, which means the art of war is not a book purely th theoretical, but a book that combines theories and practice. And this helps people build up co cognitive schema and structure. Um, that is a way human beings employ to interpret and comprehend complex knowledge. So the above arguments explain why people find applying the art of war to different conflicts and strategic thinking fascinating and thus the boom of related publication. So uh, uh, in conclusion, uh, the publication of the art of war is, uh, 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 is very popular at the, at the moment and actually is, it is a topic still needs further investigation. And uh, so uh, today, uh, my presentation is just a beginning, a start, uh, and I will dig into the, the adaptations of the art of war and study how the, uh, whether there is a pattern or uh, uh, a, a, 
there are, or whether whether there are any motives behind the ad adaptations, a, a clearer motive or more uh, complex motives behind. Yes, that's all my sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation and, uh, you know, uh, about the strategy and uh, and strategic thinking also, you know, the connection with war. But again, we leave uh, the discussion uh, at the end. Uh, but I appreciate uh, also your idea because I'm, I, I trust that it's very, very useful for companies also. Uh, now I go to the next presentation. I see that, uh, Carlo, uh, I don't know if I have to read in, in French language or in English, but first I read the... the oh, the, sorry, I'm sorry. Did I oh. press the wrong button? Really? No? Okay, you can. Uh, can I just... Uh, if you wanted to stop, okay. Perfect, perfect. Now it's perfect. Okay, thank then you. Then the next presentation will be about the East-West uh, David mapping the literature of Asia through the, the lens of uh, cryptometrics. And uh, uh, is, I leave the floor to Carolina Ferrer, is it in Francais or Carolina Ferrer, I don't know. And uh, <laughs> from the University of Quebec uh, at Montreal, uh, Canada. And uh, I know that uh, uh, she's uh, online because I saw the name. Then are you there? Are Oops, you ready uh, for presenting? Yes. Hello. I'm, I'm here, but I, I believe I have a problem with uh, sharing my... No, 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 no. Just uh, you have to, to put on your screen your presentation because I think it's okay. Okay, perfect. Now it's perfect. We can do, see do the presentation. See okay. Yes, okay, yes, good. we can see that what the presentation is perfect. Okay, you I can don't repeat see you. your name because I don't know it's French name, English name, then you can repeat your name and your university. Of course. No, it was perfect like before, not now, before. Okay, like that? Perfect. Now, now it's perfect. Okay, now, now it's excellent. Um, yes, uh, my name, uh, either in, in, uh, in French or in Spanish, uh, so in Spanish is uh, Carolina Ferrer. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Quebec uh, at Montreal, and so for me it's uh, Friday morning. <laughs> okay, so uh, <laughs> I know, I know, very, very strange, uh, very strange time for you. I'm so sorry because I think maybe okay. she's not there, but you are there. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> no, it's you. it's perfect. It's uh, ten thirty in the morning. It's perfect. No problem. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> So th uh, first of all, thank you very, very much for the organizers to the organizers of this uh, of this conference, um, and uh, I would also like to uh, thank the Conseil de Recherche en Sciences Humaines du Canada, which is the uh, institution that um, gives the financial support for this uh, research. Okay, so um, I'll start uh, right away. So a systems theory and critical metrics. In 2018, based on a system analysis introduced in social sciences and the humanities by Niklas Luhmann and Emmanuel Wallerstein, and more precisely on the concept of champ developed by Pierre Bourdieu, as well as on polysystem theory proposed by Itamar Even Zoar, we inaugurated a research project with the purpose of mapping world literature. According to Pierre Bourdieu, I quote, the social world can be decomposed into a multitude of microcosms, the fields or champs, each one featuring specific stakes, objects, and interests, end of quote. Moreover, the configuration of the fields is characterized by complex relations between their uh, diverse components. Likewise, the interactions between national literatures also constitute complex phenomena with the aim of understanding Understanding these interactions, we use Itamar Evenzoar's polysystem studies that allowed him to formulate hypotheses about the functional relations between the components of the systems and subsystems under scrutiny. In our research, we articulate these concepts with empirical analysis by using critical metrics, a methodology that we have elaborated inspired by scientometrics. 
Initially developed by PRICE, the goal of Scientometrics is to measure and to, an to analyze scientific and technological activity. By analogy, we created Criticometrics in order to study the activity of the critique in the arts. Thus, we have adjusted, adjusted Scientometric indicators to the reality of the databases dedicated to the arts, particularly to literary studies. In this sense, we propose to use critical metrics as a method to explore and analyze large volumes of literary elements, texts, writers, critiques, etc., and to study the relations at different levels of the system. In fact, the recent advances in technology, usually referred to as digital humanities, have made large volumes of references available for us to explore at scales that were unthinkable just a few decades ago. In this research, we use the techniques of keywords and data mining in order to obtain the references that correspond to the 202 national literatures that currently constitute world literature. Specifically, we interrogated the main liter literary database, the Modern Language Association International Bibliography, to which we will refer to as MLA. This database contains over 2.8 million references and covers more than 150 years of texts published by the international academic community. World literature. Firstly, we compile the critical references for each national literature by querying the terms French literature, Spanish literature, and so on. Secondly, the world sample was created by forming an ensemble of the national literatures. This sample contains 1,777,000 references, distributed into 68% papers, 22% book chapters, 9% books, and 1% editions. This, the beer covered is 1850 to 2018. As we can observe in graph one, Publications are highly concentrated in a small number of countries. Actually, 16 national literatures accumulate 89% of the references, whereas the others individually represent less than 1% of the publications. According to this indicator, the top literatures are the United Kingdom, the United States of America, France, Germany, Spain, Italy, Russia, Ireland, China, Canada, Ukraine, the Czech Republic, Austria, Romania, Argentina, and the Netherlands. Thirdly, we formed the different continental literary systems. As shown in graph two, the world system is highly Eurocentric with Europe accumulating 68% of the references followed by the Americas 24%, Asia 5%, Africa 2% and Oceania 1%. Graph three represents the distribution of the documents by language of publication for the world, as well as the continents. In the case of the world system, English corresponds to 56% of the sample, followed by French, Spanish, German, Italian, Russian, and Chinese, Portuguese, and Ukrainian. There are more than 90 other languages that individually represent less than 1% of the sample. English is the most important language of publication in each and every continent. French is the second language of publication in Europe and Africa, whereas Spanish is the second most important language in the Americas and Chinese in Asia. So now we turn to the literatures of Asia. The Asian literary system encompasses 45 national literatures and constitutes a sample of 89,000 references. As shown in graph four, 10 literatures accumulate more than 1% of the continental system. The other literatures together accumulate 8% of the sample. China alone represents 42% of the references about the Asian continent. Table one corresponds to the top 20 writers of the literary system of Asia. Uh, now I have to say that we have uh, a, a huge list of writers from uh, all over uh, the world, from uh, uh, all the national literatures. Um, we're talking about uh, uh, 11,000 uh, writers, okay? Um, so in, in the case of Asia, 
uh, 13 of them are Chinese, four from India, one from Japan, one from Israel, and one from uh, Palestine. There are no women on the list, as you can see. Table two uh, presents the top 20 literary forms from Asia. Again, the majority is Chinese, followed by India, Japan, and Iran. Uh, in, in this case, uh, there is one uh, uh, work that is signed by a woman, uh, which, which is uh, the Japanese uh, Murasaki Shikibu. Now, with the purpose of identifying the, uh, possible interference by other countries, we classified the country of publication of the top 50% journal articles. As shown in graph 5, we uh, represented the Asian journals on the top and the extracontinental ones at the bottom. China accumulates over 27% of this sample, followed by Japan, Taiwan, and India. At the foreign level, the USA accumulates 7% of the articles, the UK 4%, and the Netherlands 2%. The system is clearly dominated by China. We also observe an important interference from the USA. Now we have uh, decided to um, select a, a certain number of, of writers uh, to show the relations uh, that are established between uh, different uh, uh, national literatures. So uh, finally, we analyzed a sample of 10 Asian writers. We chose the most representative ones from each country that accumulate at least 180 references. We included two women. Table uh, three contains the main metadata indicators for each writer. We elaborated several indicators for each selected writer. So uh, you can you can see that uh, we have um, uh, writers uh, from uh, different uh, different uh, national literatures, and or we also see the the, the languages of, of expression of these uh, writers. Okay. Um, so, uh, graph six uh, re represents the language of publication of the uh, documents. Um, except for Confucius, Natsume, Anyon, and Aigmatov, English is the main language of publication of the critique. In the other four cases, the language of publication corresponds to the language of expression of the writer. We also analyze the co-citation indicators. For each writer, we consider the other writers that share at least as uh, 0.5% of the references of the co-cited author. Graph uh, seven shows the co-citations by continent. Six writers are mainly co-cited with other Asian writers. A group of four is co-cited mainly with European uh, writers. Now, in graph eight, uh, we represent the co-citations by gender. We observe that eight writers are mainly co-cited with men. Whereas both women, Deze and uh, Murasaki, are co-cited mainly with women. Okay. So, uh, as conclusions, uh, I, I'm, I'm leaving you my, my uh, address and, and my um, uh, web uh, site. So, uh, we can say that critical metrics have allowed us to observe the place of the literary system of Asia. In spite of being the most populated continent, Asia only occupies the third place in the world literary system, accumulating only 5% of the critical publications registered in MLA. Although a significant percentage of these publications are in Mandarin, English is the most important language of the references. The distrib distribution of the references by national literature shows an important disequilibrium since 42% 40, of the publications are about China. This situation is also reflected on the high number of Chinese writers and works that rank at the top. China also plays an important role in terms of the place of diffusion of the critique. However, we also observe an, importance, pre, an important presence of journals about Asian literature published in the USA. This is a clear sign of literary interference if we consider uh, the term uh, used by uh, Itamar Even uh, Zohar. Finally, the analysis of a selected number of writers has shown us that usually the language of publication of the critique corresponds to the language of expression of the writer. In relation to the co-citation analysis, we observe that most publications refer to other Asian or European authors. We also observe that basically women are co-cited with other women. 
we consider that critical metrics has allowed us to examine the literary system of Asia in a very innovative perspective and has shown the importance and the relevance of introducing quantitative analysis in literary studies. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank to you for your interesting presentation and for your very you and your team. I think a very big research. Uh, then you invest, I think, a lot in this kind of research. I think that you, you was not alone, but with a team. But very interesting. Yes. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Very interesting. But of course, I leave uh, again the time for uh, question and so on at the end of the presentation. Yeah. And I ask now to Nika Cittadze uh, to, to start the presentation. The title is Global Environmental Problems and Ways for Their Resolution. Uh, and I come from uh, Black Sea University. Then I leave the floor to uh, Nika. Mm? Okay, thank you, Nika. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Um, so, yes, uh, it's great honor for me uh, to uh, talk uh, with a distinguished audience from my native uh, university. And, of course, thank you very much for the organizers, my colleagues of the events. And uh, uh, it's great honor to meet uh, here with the representatives of the different countries and uh, accordingly by this way again by this way i have the feelings that uh, i'm a part that together we are part of the global planet and citizens of the world okay with your permission today um i will discuss about the global environmental uh, problems um, so and at, uh, mm, uh, sorry one minute uh, yes uh, uh and uh, uh to uh, discuss uh, yes uh, uh, because it concerns as you uh, understand all of us yes all those uh, problems uh, which by this way yes uh, uh represents a global threat and challenge for the world development so um yeah it's first of all uh should be mentioned of course uh, uh that's about the content uh of my presentation yes uh, i will discuss yes about the climate the change on the example of the global warming world ocean pollution destruction of the ozone layer air pollution also soil degradation deforestation and desertification acid rain problems with water resources and biodiversity reduction uh, of course at the end of my presentation i express my readiness on the answer of the question and listen your i'm sure very uh, interesting uh, comments the first of all it's necessary to mention here that environment and mineral resources such as water atmosphere has always been a necessary condition for for human life and activity but it's interesting to mention that within the centuries the environmental problem by this way um, was not included to the agenda of the international uh, community and only during the uh, period of uh, industrial revolution yes for the first time particularly in the year of 1866 uh, it has appeared the terminology under the name of ecology ecology yes uh, this uh, terminology was used by the German scientist geographer Geckel. Okay, but at the same time, with regard to uh, the uh, um, discuss, hard discussions about the environment since the second half of the 20th century. First of all, it should be mentioned that first uh, international conference it was uh, held uh, in the year of uh, 1972 in Stockholm, and at the same year also it was established uh, uh, within the United Nations UNEP, United Nations Environmental uh, Program. Furthermore, we know here about the uh, foundation of the uh, different international NGOs such as Green. Worldwide Fund, for example, in the field of the environmental protection. For example, Greenpeace, by this way, was founded in the year of 1969. Okay, let's 
uh, with your permission to this time, uh, I understand that my time is limited. Uh, and of course, I do not want to take uh, as, uh, time from the other uh, presenters, um, uh, of course. And uh, uh, with your permission, just I would like to mention here, yes, related to the global warming, that according to the Oxford University uh, Encyclopedia, over the 21st century, the world average temperature will rise by about 2.5 degrees. As a result, it is possible that the number of eco-migrants uh, in the worldwide will exceed 200 million people, yes, within the uh, 21st century. It's, it's very interesting to mention that today, because of the international uh, conflicts, uh, uh, because of internal and in interstellar conflicts, number of refugees, by this way, yes, uh, uh, is about 80 million people. But with regard to the ecology, ecological catastrophe, so by this way, yes, uh, we can um, uh, um, have by this way, uh, uh, in this, it is a stretch by a stretch uh, by this way to have uh, about 200 million um, people. Uh, okay, uh, for example, one of the examples together with the global warming is uh, uh, the pollution of the world ocean. We know here that how huge territory by this way is uh, uh, covered by the world ocean. Particularly, we know here uh, that the area of our, our planet is uh, 510 uh, million uh, square uh, square kilometers, uh, and um, uh, at the same time, with regard to the world ocean, it um, occupies 71 uh, percent of the territory of our planet. Particularly, 600 six, uh, 361 million square uh, kilometers. And uh, uh, accordingly, it's necessary to mention also about the big problem related to the ocean pollution. Particularly, for example that uh, uh, every year about 20 million barrels of uh, oil, by this way, are spilled into the ocean. We know here several years ago about the scandal um, uh, related to the British Petroleum Oil Company uh, when um, this, uh, because of the activity of this company was uh, spilled uh, more than 5 million uh, tons of uh, um, oil in the territory of the uh, Persian, uh, Persian Gulf. Uh, okay, um, so with regard to the air pollution with regard to the air pollution with your permission i would like to mention that up to the seven according to the world health organization data up to the seven million people die each year as a result of the air pollution can we imagine uh here that uh, as a result of COVID 19 yes uh, we suffered yes uh, uh each country by this way suffered from the COVID 19 uh, with your permission um, i will bring some examples that uh, within the two years period a number of victims is about uh, four million eight hundred million people within the two years period but with regard to air pollution it uh, dies um, every year much more uh, people than for example people who are diseased with uh, COVID-19 7 million people uh, per uh, year uh, but no with regard to the main sources of air pollution uh, of course uh, you know about it yes it's a, a functioning of the uh, factories by this way functioning of the uh, transport uh, yes uh, also um, agricultural activities uh, by this way yes uh, we know everything yes uh, about it and uh, there were some efforts yes to stop uh, the air pollution uh, for example um, in 1992 uh, uh, it was held the conference in rio, rio de janeiro kyoto protocol uh, was um, adopted in the year of 1998 but about it a little bit uh, later with regard to the destruction of the ozone lawyer with regard to the ozone lawyer it's for the first time it was discovered uh, in 1985 by the british sound the scientists uh, over the territory of Antarctica. And uh, we know here that lawyer uh, uh, the atmosphere is at the attitude uh, between 12 and uh, 50 kilometers, um, uh, 50 kilometers of, uh, above the Earth, uh, Earth and uh, it, 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 it represents one of the types of oxygen. Yes, we know, yes, and O3. And value of ozone for human lies in the fact that it blocks uh, uh, ultraviolet rays, protecting all living things from as uh, all living being from the uh, solar radiation with regard to the soil degradation we can see on the map uh, by this way those, those territories which especially suffered by this way yes uh, as a result of uh, 
result of the farming, etc., etc., etc. Besides, by this way, there are some other territories, Jewish territories, which are covered by deserts. Yes, I mean, Sahara Desert here, for example, Karakum Desert in Central Asia, you can see here. Yeah, anyway, um, so uh, central part of Australia also is covered by uh, deserts. But in general, by this way, it's a uh, um, by this way danger as that soil borne bacteria, for example, yes, uh, can kill up to the 700 million, 700,000 people per year. By this way, yes, so, okay, reduction of uh, forest. Uh, Massive, massive. Forests occupy about 30% of the Earth's uh, surface. And can we imagine by this way that um, about 150,000 square kilometers of forests uh, are cut down every year? It means by this way, uh, two territories of Georgia. I mean, country, my native country, country which hosts uh, hosts uh, today's uh, international conference because uh, territory of Georgia is 69.7 square uh, kilometer, thousand square uh, kilometers. And can you imagine even more than two Georgia by this way? Yes, uh, uh, on those territories. Yes, it is uh, cut by this way. By um, it is cut. And can we imagine here that, uh, for example, if in the beginning of the uh, 20th century, about 12% of uh, the uh, world was covered by um, tropical forests. Today, only 6% of the Earth's surface is covered by the tropical uh, forests. Acid rain. With regard to the acid rain, you know, because of this uh, faction, uh, function of uh, factories, and so I said, the term acid rain, yeah, it, 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 acid rain itself, uh, it's emerged. And uh, for the first time, by this way, it was uh, used, this terminology, by the uh, British uh, um, uh, scholar Robert Smith in the year of 1872, when he published his book under the name Air and Rain, the basics of uh, Climatology. With regard to the water resources, again, yes, I discussed here about the ocean uh, resources, uh, world ocean resources, and about the uh, spilling of oil, yes, uh, and other materials in the world ocean. But with your permission, I uh, would like to discuss also about the problem related to the uh, deficit of the fresh water. With regard to the fresh water, we know here that uh, on the share of the fresh water is coming only. 2.5 percent of uh, the uh, water resources um, in the world, and the amount of uh, this 2.5 yes, uh, and uh, with regard to the whole by this way um, um, resources of the f fresh water, uh, biggest part about 70 percent is uh, located in the ices of Antarctica and uh, Arctica. Uh, okay, and also there were some uh, this uh, um, water uh, and uh, underway uh, waters by this way yes and uh, today by this way about one third of the world population uh, suffers uh, from the deficit of the fresh water and we know here that each year the world population is increasing by about 80 85 uh, uh, million people 90 percent of the uh, growth of the population uh, reproduction itself yeah, is coming on the countries from the global south. Accordingly, by this way, where even today, by this way, the deficit of the fresh water, uh, yes, um, uh, by this way, is one of the most actual uh, problem. Yes, and uh, accordingly, uh, if uh, by this way we take into consideration that according to the UN population plan, uh, the, the population fund, uh, uh, in 2050, uh, world population will reach about 10 million. 10 billion people, we can mention here that about half of the world population during this period will not have an appropriate ex access to the uh, drinking uh, drinking water, by this way. Yes, okay. We can see here, yes, how uh, plastic ocean, yes, how is that, uh, for example, each year about 2.5 billion metric tons of uh, solid waste is produced all around the world, for example. Yes, how, by this way, yes, uh, it's uh, affected by this way, yes, uh, as uh, uh, water resources as a result of uh, uh, modern uh situation social economic and political situation in our planet uh furthermore i would like to mention also uh, that uh, as an example uh the report of the worldwide fund according to which uh within the period from 1970 till 2016 the total number of all mammals birds replies and fish and, and uh, amphibians decreased by about 68 percent 
68 percent i mean here uh not a uh, type of uh, uh the animals but i mean here the all bodies where this uh, fauna uh, i mean uh, uh the resources of fauna by 68 percent no because of hunting because of uh, some ecological catastrophes and etc uh, etc et no we know here about it no at the same time with your permission i would like to mention that uh, there are by this way four thousand mammal types or kind of mammals in our planet about uh, uh, nine thousand fishes and about twenty thousand birds different type of uh, uh, birds okay um, so uh, with your uh, permission also I, um, uh, I would like to say uh, also uh, that uh, of course humanity somehow works and tries by this way uh, to uh, resolve the problems related to uh, the environment Among of them it should be mentioned here as I uh, uh pointed out in the beginning of my presentation yes about the foundation of the united nations environmental program in 1972 uh, uh furthermore later no because of the activity of unep and uh, different countries uh, in 1977 it, uh, they were adopted so-called helsinki rules related to the regulations uh, environmental situation maritime convention in 1982 which determined uh, by this way yes uh, the principle of territorial water by the coastal country and um, territory of uh, the uh, special economic zone about 200 miles uh, territory uh, and where by this way country uh, for example should take the responsibility in, in the field of environment uh, environment uh, protection uh, when by this way the uh, concrete country in this regard uh, uh, let's say here produces uh, concrete uh, resources uh, from the bottom of the uh, no, uh, sea or ocean furthermore we know, we know here the first by this way global conference air summit it was held in rio de janeiro in the year of 1992 uh, furthermore, I would like to mention here, yes, about the Kyoto Protocol, which by this way, uh, main purpose of which by this way, it's a, a reduction of uh, the poisoning cases uh, in atmosphere, by this way, main responsibilities in this case uh, were put on the uh, economically developed countries and treaty of paris in 2016 yes and uh, there were 195 uh, countries by this way which uh, joined uh, this um, uh, treaty for the improvement of the environmental um, uh, problems in uh, this um, uh in this regard okay um, so and uh, uh in general by this way we should mention here that somehow this globalization we know that plays very uh, important role yes in the uh, integration processes and in increasing cooperation among all the countries and in my point of view somehow by this way globalization can uh, play a positive role uh in um, as uh, strengthening the cooperation of the countries, uh, the different fields, yes, uh, including by this way, uh, the environmental issues, by this way, and also uh, it should unify the forces for the raising the awareness uh, of the world population for the resolving of the different types of uh, the, uh, global uh, problems. Yes, uh, it's problem which, uh, uh, as you uh, guess by this way, uh, concern each of uh, us and uh, we should uh, resolve uh, this uh, problem by this way uh, together, of course. Yes, and uh, uh, but um, despite of it, today by this way, world uh, is faced with the uh, biggest uh, problem related to the environment, uh, about mentioned problems, which I uh, mentioned here, uh, here but uh, let's hope uh, that uh, according because of the efforts of the different uh, international um, governmental organizations and uh, efforts of the uh, different uh, international non-governmental uh, organizations and even transnational corporations for example the problem somehow uh, by this way can uh, be uh, uh, resolved okay uh, so thank you uh, very much for the listening to me and of course i express my readiness to answer all your questions if any and uh, at the same time uh, of course with your permission uh, with great pleasure i will listen to the other uh, presenters uh thank you very much thank you for your presentation it was interesting especially the role of education that we have to think about this very very, very well um we have the last presentation and after that we can start our discussion
Uh, the last presentation will be about educational data mining for student teacher assessment through Google uh, Colab. And uh, the presenter are Muhammad Noman Sarid and Hamad Muraresh Ol Mufaresh, something, something similar, from Saudi Arabia. Uh, I know that uh, one of them of both uh, are there please i leave the floor to you and uh, you can start your presentation thank you no we cannot uh, uh you have not the microphone please open the microphone because we cannot listen to you Okay, thank you. Am I audible now? Perfect, perfect. Now it's perfect. And uh, we can see also your presentation now. Thank you. Great, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, but let me first uh, thanks to the organizer of the, this uh, conference and uh, introduce myself. My name is Mohammed Numan Saeed and my co-author was Dr. Ahmed al Mufarra. Uh, we are actually from Jazan University and working in the e-learning department and information technology. Uh, for today's uh, presentation, uh, we have, uh, this is actually an um, ongoing research project which we are uh, doing uh, currently in uh, our university and in our department especially. It is about the educational data mining for student teacher assessment through Google Collab. And we will further see why we need this and how it has become. This is the content of our uh, presentation. We will start from the introduction, goals of our study, data mining, AI techniques, which will we can use in the education, as well as machine learning types, framework, and uh, what are our plan uh, for completing this uh, research. So in introduction uh, phase of this presentation, I would uh, just uh, remind you the worst uh, case which we have in during the COVID-19 scenario which uh, actually um, leave behind so many things on so many uh, domains especially in the education as well when we see that there were educational institute from the pre-primary to the universities were closed and we do have uh, some um, serious uh, assessment uh, issues. Uh, let me give you an example about the British Council. The British Council have a history of conducting an examination since several years, but uh, during the COVID, they have cancelled their examination and they have changed the assessment from the uh, exam base to something others, for example, the predicted grades. So we have, you know, we have seen these uh, uh, scenarios which were, which, we, which were not at that time or during COVID in our um, uh, on our table. Uh, a part of that uh, assessment issues, uh, what we have done uh, or what, what the teacher done uh, during the COVID is to use massive on open online courses as well as the uh, web-based lectures through a learning management system. Although that these technologies, the mocks and the WBL use of learning management system are mainly for those countries or the for those students particularly which we have which do have the resources available and again in those countries which don't have the uh, uh, resources available uh, for example the internet laptop smartphones what those students done and just imagining a, a dental student or mbbs student or doctorate student who is in the last fourth or fifth year of their studies they don't have access to the last uh, uh, academic year how can you assess that? So these are uh, some uh, serious problem and that we have learned during the COVID-19. So our goal of study uh, is to define some framework uh, for determining the performance assessment of students and not only the students because later in the presentation, I will present that there are some uh, uh, work already done from uh, um, several researchers uh, but they are emphasizing on performance assessment of the students uh, on different levels. But uh, as I said that we are from the e-learning department and I am uh, coordinating and I am in between the, between the students and the teachers. So I know that there is 
some framework as well for the assessment of teachers as well because both of these are vice versa uh, and uh, the effect of the teachers is actually applied on the student performance and a student performance is actually depend on the performance of teacher as well so uh, we can combine uh, these uh, assessment technique for better understanding and results as well so predicting future teacher training and that's what happened then we if we assess the student on the teachers that was actually help us to predict the future teaching and learning outcome not only from the students but also for the academic management as well to decide or um, enhance the teacher or faculty profile as well might be the might be uh, the teacher or the faculty need some more it uh, enabled teaching as well um, because we have um, learned during the COVID that some uh, some teachers who never use the laptops in their uh, 45 or 50 uh, years at age and they, they never use those technologies, they never use the LMS, they don't know about the model, they don't know about the blackboard and ultimately you give them the, oh, this is your course and you have to conduct this like this way. So that, that those are much more um, serious thing which we have to solve it now because God forbid if we have something other happen god forbid so we have already uh, prepared uh, ourselves so ultimately it is on the bold that we built a model that uses tutor sheet of pass in current enact in enactment for predicting their future performance of course we have to do and we have to do some of our work from the past experiences of the student and the teachers so now the first part of the presentation is about the data mining what exactly the data mining and particularly the educational data mining. So educational data mining is, is, is a data mining technique, but this is a data mining is only happening with the data coming from the educational background or from the from, from that field which is actually uh, depending or coming with the educational applications. So uh, what sort of data, any sort of data that comes from the universities, school, colleges, and not only the departments or the management of schools, the, the data that come from the LMS as well. We have a lot of data from the Blackboard. Black, uh, let me give my example. In my university, the Blackboard LMS is using, and we have a lot of data from the Blackboard LMS that can be modified, that can be mined in a way that we can uh, understand the pattern of the teacher style, what the teacher did in their um, course during this uh, COVID or the student, we can distinguish the student as well, what they have done during this uh, uh, this online, uh, online uh, scenarios. So those data is very much important, but that important that this EDM is referred only that data that is coming from the educational background or the educational purposes. Next uh, uh, is about uh, the artificial intelligence. Yes, we need the artificial intelligence. We have uh, learned so many um, uh, things and we, uh, we um, use this word so frequently in, in almost every field of life, not only the education, but we can see oh, artificial intelligence in the healthcare, artificial intelligence in data security, in the social media, uh, the Facebook uses this artificial intelligence to judge what you are uh, doing or what will, uh, what should he show you. So artificial intelligence or the AI technique is now in every part of our life. So why not we can use in, in, in a better way for the academics as well. This is a, a, a more generic um, a diagram that uh, can uh, sh show you or um, artifact view the three main thing. That's artificial intelligence. That's a primary domain. And under the artificial intelligence, we have the machine learning and where we are actually developing a model that can help us. And in that machine learning, we have the deep learning, which is a it, you can say that is an advanced form of the machine learning techniques. So our focus is on the machine learning for our study and why we will define later. So machine learning is a set of algorithms, simple, that allows computers to learn from the data and that data I have already defined as an EDM data without being explicitly programmed. So AI in education, uh, based on the uh, knowledge space theory in 1999, it's uh, depend 
you can use the AI education for personalized learning, for developing the new content, to enhance the new content, to show what the actually the user or student want to uh, to learn at that particular specific of time. So AI is is something you know in every field of life in the uh, in the e-learning domain. Machine learning. So it's a set of technique that gives computer the ability to learn without the uh, intervention of human programming. Uh, it's it's clearly said that we have to develop such model that just we put the data in into that model and it gives you the predicted outcomes. So normally the traditional programming uh, in in traditional programming uh, or a computer programming you can say that we have to define the rules and data and it will give you an answer as well. But in the machine learning uh, or machine learning environment, we are actually provided the data and the result, which is the answer. And between what happened, that is actually uh, defined by the machine learning. On which basis it gives this, taking this data and give you the this results. So this is more uh, specific from the machine learning. Machine learning can be divided in two main, uh, main uh, algorithms part, the sp supervised uh, machine learning and the unsupervised uh, machine learning. In supervised uh, learning, mach uh, machine learning is like a teacher-based classroom style where actually a faculty teach the student, oh, this is one plus one is equal to two. This is one plus one. And it is repeat, 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 repeat till the students understand, yes, it's one plus one is equal to two. And that's the supervised machine learning. And in unsupervised is learn, uh, machine learning, and the uh, picture uh, will show later. But it's simply a, so in unsupervised uh, learning, we simply give them the content. Okay, this is the content, and you have to decide what will be the one plus one, and one plus one, whether it's a two, three, or four, or whatever. So in supervised uh, uh, learning, um, it's a type of machine learning which are, um, or I can just uh, because I'm short of time. So let me. Uh, come directly to this picture and it will uh, show you all the things or what I would like to explain. In supervised learning, we, as I said, that we have data, the EDM data, for example, in our case. And by the way, we can use this in any um, environment. I, I, I just missed that uh, the first presentation talking about some uh, orange peels and some fashion industry. So a machine learning in Gautam is also used in the fashion industry as well. Machine learning in Gautam also used also use in the environmental uh, things to determine what happened in, uh, in let's say, it's in, in weather forecasting. It is already, but in weather forecasting, what happened? We have the data. So if we have the data and we know that, okay, this is the data and these are the results, we will use a supervised uh, algorithm to train our system and that is defined in, on the left portion of this uh, diagram in which we have some data which we have uh, the hexagon square and triangle and we have labeled them that okay this is the triangle this is the square and we explained like one plus one is equal to two one plus two is equal to three and we simply labeled it and give to the model and it uh, predict what is the square and what is a triangle but of course Blood example, we have the 100 uh, uh, rows of data. So we split this 100 rows in, for example, 70 and the 30. And 70 will give them to the model, please train yourself. And when it is trained, then we put the remaining 30 and check our model whether it is working or not. So just imagining if we have a thousand number of students in our uh, university, we just taken all of those uh, features and what are the features it's later defined, What taking that features and give the 70% of that in our model to train our model so that the remaining 30 can be verified. And why it is needed, uh, why it is needed, and as I said, that it can help us, the teachers, help the management to decide whether the faculty, whether for the faculty point of view, the faculty is uh, uh, good, or whether the teacher is good for 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 this uh, course, or is he teaching good, or is he teaching bad, or whatever. And the, on the other side is unsupervised learning, and unsupervised learning is uh, like this. In unsupervised learning, we just give the content to the uh, learner. Uh, okay, just learn and decide yourself. So. In, in, in supervised learning and supervised learning, which we will use for our data. So normally, when we have the results, we will go for the supervised learning when we have the results. So when we are talking about the student assessment or the teacher assessment, definitely we will go to the 
supervised learning uh, supervised learning why because we have the data we have we know that this student secured these marks in the uh, grade 10 examination grade 12 examination in semester 1 2 3 4 examination and that is the result and we also have the uh, faculty data okay this is the faculty he received this uh, bachelor's here from master's here phd here and he has this publication here and okay this is uh, his uh, results so we will go for the supervised learning for our um, uh, uh, learning but why not for the unsupervised learning unsupervised learning in unsupervised learning we we may not uh, propose it why because it is as per the diagram the uh, you can see that it might be a student learn in some uh, other things it, it might be so one plus one is not equal to two why because there is no supervision in in that uh, uh, criteria but of course it is much more uh, um, nearer to the artificial intelligence So assessment in learning, uh, as I said, uh, that is very crucial now, at least now, to decide for every institution to have such type of uh, framework and such type of uh, uh, working in their education inst institutes, not only for this, again, as I said, not only for the student, but for the teacher as well. Uh, these are some of the paper which we have uh, uh, carried out in our studies more than that but i just put the four uh, papers um, and the reference will be given in our uh, final paper as well so in first paper we we we, uh, we have concluded that the algorithms which, which those uh, um, paper uh, paper use are uh, the j um, 48 uh, random forest and nb nb are those are all supervised algorithms and the key parameter is that what they will use the demographic, demographic, age, gender, and academic parameters, project marks, and like these things. Uh, the other paper is also using the same pattern. It uses the support vector machine. These are all the algorithm um, uh, which we are using in the supervised learning. I did not uh, add these because there are so many algorithms. But we have the paper number three as well, which uses the EDM techniques to early identify the student those are likely to fail. And there they use the neural network. and this neural network is not the supervised learning uh, algorithm. It is particularly an unsupervised learning algorithm, but they merge those algorithm and check what are the uh, new results. So we have noticed that all these and the uh, more uh, papers are only focused on the students uh, part as well. What we have decided and what we have proposed that we need the teacher assessment criteria uh, criteria as well based on these papers okay we we need the demographic uh, personal for that uh, for that faculty we need the academic criteria for that faculty we need the technical assessment of that for that faculty and as well as a previous student performance what hap what happens for the students what happened to those students which were taught by that particular teacher so that we can uh, train our system and it will be trained, 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 trained until it comes to the very uh, fine teacher and fine faculty member for the specific courses. That is a, a teacher assessment point, point of view. For the student point of view, the same thing, the same criteria, but from the student perspe uh, perspective. And here we put also some more um, thing as well. It's about the family background. Uh, student family background is also a very, very key factor that in that uh, pin out those student assessment and during the whole uh, academic cycle. This is our roadmap and uh, we need uh, to get the data. Um, from where we get the data, we have so many um, repositories as well, but all those repositories are actually the uh, providing the free data. But we are uh, waiting for is to get the official data from some institution so that we can train our model and um, distinguish these uh, assessment and define these assessment. So my conclusion is that uh, we are now proposing uh, the machine learning based or AI based um, assessment framework for both student for both student and teacher in a particular institution this is our conclusion and the last uh, slide is just uh, take 2 minutes more so uh, thank you very much for uh, the for for listening to me and i'm actually currently looking for my phd opportunities as well so if you have some opportunity uh, do let me know and my email address is nomansir@gmail.com uh, if you thank have you a question much. you Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for also for your presentation. Interesting it was. Uh,
the the last but not you know the not least not the the, the it was very important and um now we have uh, your 15 less than 15 minutes 12 12 30 minutes for question uh, then i ask i have something to say but first of all i ask to you if you have question uh, because at um, half past um, seven in the georgian time we have the closing section uh, the, somebody has a question um, if there are some questions, you can say, please, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Carolina, yes. you can say. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to all the presenters. Uh, very, very interesting uh, communications. And um, I have one case, question for you, uh, Patricia, which is, um, what is the state of um, recycling policies in Italy? Um, how? Are there any uh, <laughs> uh, usual ways of recycling? Uh, because we, we do a lot of that in Canada. So, yeah, no, we 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 do a lot for recycle. Uh, we are trying also to create a culture of recycle. That uh, you know, in our house we have to divide everything and to recycle. But we are not really sure if at the end they recycle everything. Then we are pushing also companies to use waste because you know uh, uh, normal people can use can divide the waste but if nobody use uh, also government are not pushing to recycle really then we are pushing company like you saw in my example three companies for example italian company that use some kind of waste because if become popular to use waste and the people ask for dresses or so something else made by uh, my waist, uh, you know, uh, we think that the situation will become more and more and more uh, more popular. Then we are thinking that the best solution is to create a culture. Uh, for example, in packaging, now we are uh, working so much in changing the packaging, no plastic, uh, no, and so on. Then you can see in the shop uh, that uh, um, now is uh, the advertising. Uh, we don't use plastic, but we use recycling paper. Then the best way is not only yet we divide the waste, but also to use the waste, especially to communicate the company are using a waste. For example, also in dresses. Uh, now uh, you can see that they, there is written in the dress we use this kind of raw material. You can uh, re recycle your dresses. For example, the problem for dresses is that they are made with two different kinds of raw material that you cannot recycle because they are all together. Then uh, now they say, okay, is made only of co recycled cotton or made by orange and so on. But uh, no, uh, it's a lo long, long journey, long road, but we are working so hard in the, this direction especially young people. Young people are very, yeah, yeah, like, like uh, in one um, education, you know, also Nika, Nika said uh, education to educate young people. Young people are very focused on, uh, on recycle or using waste and so on. But I think that also in your country, you are very focused on, uh, on recycling. And, Right. Yes, we have a huge uh, uh, ways of recycling. Uh, we separate our waste uh, at home, and then everywhere you can find uh, uh, buckets where you can place paper or plastic or, and, and so on. Uh, and then there are many companies that uh, actually make new products out of uh, recycled material. Yeah. Yeah. Still, uh, a lot of a lot of, a lot of uh, waste goes to the, to the dump uh, site. Uh, yeah, of of course, of course, it's normal. But you know, yeah. we are, there are some so many ways to use. For example, all the tires. You know, it, there are so many ways to use. We also company in fashion that they use to make bags, but fashion bags and uh, and so on. Then you know, mm -hmm. if they use in this way, they can create more value, and a new company are more um, ready to do this kind of job. Right. Yes. Yes. Thank you for your answer. <laughs> Thank you very much for the question.
that are some other question uh, because I have so many questions but I, I, I don't know if I have enough time because um, but if nobody has question I just uh, skip from one uh, uh, to the other presentation. Uh, first of all, I have to say that uh, was very interesting section because uh, we come for different part of the world, then also different kind of view, a different culture, and we try to put together the different culture. Then it was very interesting because uh, we start from India, but also from Hong Kong, and uh, Ukraine was not there, but I think that was very useful, and Canada and Saudi Arabia, and also Italy, of course, and uh, Georgia, because uh, the, Georgia is the, the very important country. It's a pity that we cannot be there, but next year, of course, I wanted to be there because I like Georgia so much. I like Kachapuri and I like Georgian culture. Then I miss Georgia so much every year I go there. Then, of course, next year I don't want to be uh, in my house, but uh, in Georgia. And about the, our track, uh, we start uh, with a very interesting uh, um, paper about uh, landscape, about also the connection between landscape, culture, and uh, and also music and so on from an interesting country also. And I have a question. I uh, wanted to say, but do you think that, you know, India is a very big country, then you uh, talk about the culture, you know, uh, different culture, but do you think that the... the if, if you check uh, paint and music, there is a difference between one part of India on the other, or at the end, the culture is the same? Uh, Bala, can I go? Please, please. Yeah, uh, I mean, we are all aware that India is extremely diverse. Um, uh, so obviously, there are multiple music traditions, multiple painting traditions, and multiple ways these connections happen. Uh, so, in fact, Balaji and I intend to include more and more um, uh, paintings, more and more styles of paintings, uh, so that we can have a more comprehensive idea. But uh, no, it's not the same. It's rather uh, different. But it's very in interesting fact, to, to, in to in understand. Fact, to that, when... Sorry, sorry. Yeah. can I add? Hello, but it's very interesting Thank to understand from a uh, paint, you know, how yeah. how the connection between the culture, music, and so on, then to understand that people, you know, to, to read the paint. In fact, to add to that, I did my PhD to understand uh, music traditions and cultural landscape in southern part of India. In fact, now we were showing you uh, mostly the northern uh, tradition, southern part of India, where we uh, the painting tradition does not exist. So uh, we're cross-referencing the music, but we have other traditions such as uh, sculptures and relief work, um, taking the textual uh, treatises and interpreting them into the sculptural and relief form on temple walls. So there are these various expressions, um, which is very diverse. Across India, it is very, very diverse. OK, very interesting. And the other paper was about the war. But you know, also, here is very interesting the connection uh, between war and you know strategy, and strategy apply for me to the company, of course. Then I, I say that is a very interesting view, especially also in the pandemic period, that was very important for the company uh, to use uh, uh, resilience management. Resilience management, in my opinion, is very connected also with the uh, way to manage uh, the, the very quick problem, you know, like in the war. Then what do you think uh, um, that during the pandemic period was also important, uh, the kind of connection between the war strategy or like in the other period? No, we cannot. We cannot hear you. I see that you. Are... Uh, yes, I actually okay. think uh, because uh, the pandemic uh, period is also a kind of problem. Uh, we also need to solve the problem. And actually, the book "The Art of War" is actually a problem-solving, strategic thinking, uh, 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 a strategy, strategic. Uh, book. So uh, I think that 
that might be able to uh, apply to the this kind of situation. Actually, there are adaptations uh, between the art of war and um, medical problems, uh, surgical problems. Yes, like like this kind of things. So I think it's it's connected. Yeah, thank you very much. Also, in my opinion, it was very, very important to apply uh, this kind of strategy because the problem was so big and so quick that uh, helped so much to use the, the strategy of, uh, that you use in the world. Uh, thank you again, uh, Carolina Yevos. So a, a question for you, because you uh, make a so interesting map of the literature in the world that I, I didn't think before to that kind of research, but very, very interesting. But in my Thank opinion, you. and you also research in uh, in China, in some part of the in Asia, not only China, but in, uh, what do you think about uh, how uh, now is developing uh, the Chinese article, especially in English uh, journal, then maybe in the future the map will change, or what do you think about it? Uh... We have mapped the whole world. I, I just presented Asia today, but uh, yeah, it remains extremely Eurocentric. Uh, so there are huge uh, disequilibriums. For instance, if you just take the references in that database uh, about uh, Shakespeare, uh, we have over 45,000 references. If you compare that to the references that relate to the... the, the uh, all, all African literatures, which is 30,000 references. So just for one British writer, you have 1.5 times all the references yeah. about Africa. I'm talking about this kind of disequilibrium. So it's, it's huge. So in order to overcome um, uh, mm -hmm. this situation, there would have to be so many, many uh, yeah. publications about uh, other literatures. And, and if, if you just take um, yeah. uh, Western uh, Europe plus the U.S., then you almost uh, leave uh, out uh, the, the, the rest of the world. Um, and, and then you have such big uh, literary figures like, uh, like Shakespeare, but it's not the only one. Uh, so uh, we have, uh, I didn't have time to present all, all that we have been uh, yeah. doing. But um, I can imagine <laughs> very big research. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's, a, it's a big research. Uh, we, yeah. we have some indicators to to uh, um, calculate the diversification, uh, the diversity of uh, the literary system, the oral literary system, and and so and so on. Uh, what we see also that is very interesting is uh, uh, publications that are done about uh, national literatures, um, especially in the U.S. And you, you can find um, journals dedicated, for instance, to the literatures of the Maghreb. And you would think, oh, yeah. you know, probably it would uh, be done in France, which was the, the uh, previous um, colonizer. But uh, no, it's, uh, it's in somewhere in, in, some, uh, in, in a department in, in, uh, in the middle of the U.S. And uh, that's what uh, Itamar Evenzoir's uh, policy system uh, uh, theory indicates as interference. So it's much more complex than just saying, okay, we want to really invest and uh, develop our uh, national critical uh, literary yeah. system. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very I much. I hope that answers uh, your question, but. Yes, 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 but it's perfect. I was just to, to understand. Uh, you know, because you know that you have very big research than to have some more, some more information. Uh, now it's time to join uh, the plenary section, but do you think that I have time for two more questions for the other two papers or not? What do you think? Just a yeah. few minutes. Yeah. yeah, okay, because they were so interesting that it's a pity to, to leave uh, our section. Then uh, please, Nika, I have also a question for you because also you're the was very interesting and I was totally agree with you with the importance of education of young people. We are trying to do this. And what is the situation in Georgia about the education of young people? Of course, about, about ecology and so on, about the subject of your paper, of course. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, thank you very much for your uh, question. Uh, with regard to Georgia, for example, uh, several years uh, uh, ago, in Georgia it has been introduced the subject under the name of uh, civil education which is touch at the highest classes in Georgia, in the 11th and 12th classes. And at the, um, uh, in, uh, among all the main chapters, for example, it is a chapter, for example, how it's, um, uh, each citizen is obliged by this way to uh, take care of the environment. Yes, uh, and uh, uh, in this regard, it's, it's, a, it's a responsibility. But, and also, there are, uh, by this way, expressed some uh, dangers which exist, for example, on the local level uh, in Georgia and on the global level. No, with regard to the global level, we discussed. Yeah, okay. uh, with regard to uh, Georgia, uh, I would like to mention that despite the fact that Georgia is a small country, uh, with a territory of 69.7 thousand square uh, kilometers. But despite of it, uh, on the territory of Georgia, we have a sea. Uh, we have at the same time, by this way, tropical climate in the west part of Georgia, I mean, near the Black Sea region. At the same time, uh, we have, for example, plains. We have uh, uh, deserts in the eastern part of Georgia, near the border with Azerbaijan, for example. So, by this way, I think that uh, you... Um, and also we have mountains, but at the same time, time the sea, yes? And, uh, so, it's a, a different climate, by this way. And uh, uh, this, um, uh, let's say here, uh, that uh, despite of those differences, yes, okay, uh, no, it's nature by this way, yes, very complicated nature, which we have, and of course, uh, uh, each by this way, the region uh, needs by this way, its approach uh, related to the environmental uh, protection. So it is a subject, this civil education, which together with the teaching, for example, of uh, related to the democracy and human rights at the same time, etc. Also, uh, it teaches us about the responsibility uh, to take care, uh, care of our uh, uh, ecology. With regard to the higher education institutions, uh, unfortunately, in this case, uh, uh, sub subject as uh, environmental uh, problems, yes, uh, it's not touched in many in institutions or there is no faculty or department in uh, this uh, field. But, for example, at our university, in the field of... Uh, it, uh, in, within the direction of international relations and politics. For example, one of the subjects is but elective subject related to the environment and security. As you guess, by this way, on the higher education level, it's not enough by this way, unfortunately, but the situation should be improved. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And now also, uh, Mohamed, that uh, make a, a research about education and uh, interesting about learning machine and about uh, super... Uh, by supervision learning. And uh, I ask, uh, but did you start to use the supervision learning uh, in uh, all the country or also in uh, your university? And the other question is, and do you think that now if you start to use this kind of system, do you want to follow also in the future or after COVID, do you think that you will come back to the old way? Uh, no, madam, uh, we actually did not uh, use it. It's actually a uh, virtualized thing. We are proposing a system so that we can uh, okay. use it later as well. It is not uh, only exclusively for the pandemic as well. But this is our learning because when we, are, we, and we have seen and we, and we have seen and received the complaint from the student or the teachers, and th those are very weird complaints which we have never seen before. So, so based on those uh, uh, things and based on those results, we can define and refine our system for predicting the assessment of the student as well as for the teacher uh, improvement as well. Yeah, because it's a very uh, good way, for example, to reach uh, all the students. For example, I think in Italy that we have students that live in mountain and so on, then maybe they cannot go to the university. Then in this way, you can follow the student uh, and that don't yes, leave how them can you alone. Assess, yes, how can you assess the, that student? That is a question. If, you, if the student not getting the equal uh, uh, part, equal uh, technology, equal things, so how can how can they uh, use the uh, access the student as well? And let me add because uh, you you uh, you have mentioned about the Georgia and missing Georgia. I just came back from the Georgia. I was there in uh, two weeks back, and your Kashapuri ah, just wow. uh, reminding me. Uh, so thank you very much, Georgia as well. <laughs> 
then uh, I, I just say every, bye bye to everybody because we have to join uh, the, the, the final section. But I say to you goodbye next year in Georgia, in Tbilisi, because you know, if you already uh, went there, it's a wonderful country, but if you've never been there, you have to go. Of course, then next year in Georgia, how you so for the COVID, of course, pandemic, but also for us, because it's very nice to have the opportunity to meet together and to discuss together, of course, our subject. Thank you again and see you in the plenary section. OK, bye. Bye bye to everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye bye.